My primary research interest and my primary teaching interest is in the area of innovation. Um, and this has been actually before I even came into the academic world. Um, my first job as a, a graduate was working for Hewlett Packard. And I was uh, basically a software developer. And I worked, um, actually can I, I'll leave that to And this would have been the late 1980s and I developed um, what was then what you call proprietary email systems. So we didn't have PCs in those days really. Um, we basically had, IBM had its email system, Hewlett Packard had its email system. So I, I was basically working on these very early email systems. But after three years of being a software developer, um, I thought it wouldn't be interesting to be an IT consultant and I ended up eventually coming into to academia. I'll tell you a bit more of that on, at the gala dinner. Um, but when I got round to my PhD, what I was interested in was some of the things that I saw around me. Um, and some of those things I'll talk about on Saturday, if you're not watching the football. John's going John's to be watching the football, but um, <laughs> it's going to be England, USA. Um, I already know the score of that anyway. Um, <laughs> three nil to America. Um, so on Saturday, I'll be talking about my initial interest in innovation, which was where do ideas come from? Um, and I'm, I was particularly interested in informal social networks. Um, I worked in a lab and I was intrigued about where ideas came and how they moved around the lab and between the lab and marketing. So I'll talk a bit about that, but that's where my interest in innovation started, with Hewlett Packard and with this idea of, of um, social networks, knowledge flowing through social networks, uh, people sharing ideas. I always found the stuff on the formal development process pretty boring because actually I knew that people didn't really go for this formal process just like the formal organisational chart has a limited, uh, is a limited representation of how we actually communicate in organisations. So I was interested in what really happened rather than what we were told was happening. Over the years I my interest in innovation developed, so I was, I've been teaching on the MBA now, um, initially at Aston Business School in Birmingham, um, in the sort of, uh, I guess, during the, the mid-1990s, and then at Leicester. And actually, innovation is a very, very broad subject. At one level, it's about how individuals um, come up with new ideas. So it's about creativity techniques, so it's about the individual. At the other extreme, it's about government policy. How do governments um, stimulate their economies to be innovative? And then there's a whole set of different levels of analysis below that, including the organisation. How do organisations organise themselves to be innovative? What I'm going to talk about today is partly um, to do with the organisational level and partly to do with what you call the sectoral level, i.e. innovation in a particular sector. And really it's at the level of the strategy. Now one of the real weaknesses of strategy and the strategy literature is it doesn't really tell us much about technology innovation. Um, how many people here work in with technological products or, yeah, what, what sort of area? Sorry? What sort of area? HR. Yeah. So what kind of technological products are you using? Um, occupational assessments, web delivery. Okay. HRMS systems, HRS. Good. Uh, well, so that's interesting. Straight away we're getting technologies important for services. Now a lot of the literature on innovation has been focused on products rather than the service sector um, and companies that develop products for example new cars, new computers, um, 
new vehicles, etc. But actually, innovation isn't just about products. Innovation isn't just about um, new cars, new computers, new genetic engineered products. It's also about services. It's also not just about the private sector, it's also about the public sector, it's about um, the NGO sector. So innovation actually isn't just about some of the, the typical examples that we're told about. So if, if you, if I, well, we can go around the room now. Um, give me an example of an innovation. I'm just going to, anyone, anyone got any ideas of an example of an innovation? Sorry? Computer. Computer, yeah, that's good. Touch screen. Touch screen. Well, iPod or, yeah, 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 iPad. The internet. The internet. Memory sticks. Memory sticks. Mobile, phones. Mobile phones. Traffic lights, yeah. GPS. Sorry? GPS units. GPS. What's that at the back? MRI machines, yeah. Online, Online, oh, that's a different one, yeah. What's different about that one? The service. Yeah, um, other examples might be the NHS. You know, the National Health Service in Britain was actually a radical innovation, providing free national health, uh, free health service at the point of requirement. Um, you could argue, I guess, that the organisations such as the World Health Organisation are innovations. The ISO standards is an innovation in sort of process and organisation. As I said, most of the, the studies done on innovation have been on product. I'm going to talk about some of these today, but I also want to reflect on how they might be used in other sectors, for example, the, the service sectors. Um, and whether they might tell us something about um, thinking about strategy for the future. I'll plug my book, not because I get any money for it, but <laughs> um, this lecture is based on chapter four of this book by Oxford University Press, okay? And I'll do another chapter on um, Saturday. So if you, need to, if you would like to follow up any of the, um, the materials, the references at the back of the lecture, OK. So what I'm interested in is, what do we know about the patterns of innovation and technology over time that can help us think about strategy in organisations? Because strategy and setting strategy is quite a, a non-dynamic process. Whereas technology and innovation change over time, this notion of change is not normally captured very well by strategic tools. So what I want to do is present some tools that are, in a sense, dynamic and help us think about how innovation and technology emerge over time and what are the impacts of that upon companies and their strategy. So the sort of questions I want to ask um, are what patterns exist, if they do exist, in the life of a technology or an innovation? What models exist that help us uh, provide insight into why these patterns occur? And to what extent these models are useful, particularly for the service sector? And what are their implications for making strategy in organisations? Now, I guess you've all come across the product life cycle, yeah? Um, and the product life cycle is the type of model, we're not going to look at the product life cycle, but it's the sort of model that I'm looking at here. Because the product life cycle is about how a product, in terms of sales, changes over time, yeah? So the product life cycle on its y axis is about sales volume, and its x axis is about time. And I think the time dimension of models for strategy is often lacking. And for me, time matters. If you're going to project your strategy in the future, you need models that can 
embrace time. So time is important. So all of the models I'm going to look at, time is a dimension, I guess, along the, the x-axis. And these are the models that I'm going to look at. Very, very briefly, I'm going to look at something called the technology life cycle, which is very similar to the product life cycle. Then I'm going to look at something called the technology S-curve, right, which is, is looking at how the performance of a technology or an innovation changes over time. Does it have a particular pattern and what does that mean for organizations and making decisions in organizations? Then I'm going to look at a model called the product process cycle. And this is looking at the, the degree to which innovation in organizations is about developing products or developing processes. So I'll come back to that in a few minutes. The fourth model I want to look at is something called the dominant design model. If you look at many, many sectors, for example, the computer sector, you of PCs, for example, there are one or two dominant designs. Yep. So the PCs, you'll know about the IBM PC compatible, which is what most of us have on our, uh, our desks. There is also, I guess, the, the Apple, but I guess the majority of sales and volume come through the IBM. The question is, why do we end up with only one or two designs? Why do we end up with a dominant design? Um, I, I suspect I'm a little bit older than you because I can remember <laughs> when, um, when PCs first, home computers first emerged. And in England alone, we had um, Sinclair, which had this ZX81, we had um, Amstrad, we had Acorn, all these different types of computers that you may not be able to remember. But there was many, many different designs of the home computer and it's easy to forget now that there wasn't one design called the IBM PC compatible. There were many designs, and we ended up with one, largely one. And the question is, why did we get to that point? And is that a common pattern that we see? And if it is a common pattern, can you shape that pattern as an organization? And if so, how? Because these are key strategic decisions. It didn't just happen that IBM had a, a design and it became the dominant design. There were things that went on in the marketplace. Um, and many would argue that the IBM PC compatible is not the best technology. Many who have who've had been using Apple for many years would swear that Apple is better than IBM. So why is it very, very frequently that the less good technology wins? Can any of you remember Betamax? Yeah, Betamax was a particular type of, well, video Tape. Yeah. Can you remember the videotape? I should have asked. <laughs> um, there, I mean, there was two two real um, designs. One was um, VHS, and one was Betamax. Betamax was actually higher quality. So why did the lower quality product win? I mean, there's lots of reasons for that, and we'll talk a bit about them. Um, IBM is often the IBM compatible computer is often considered to be um, less technologically sophisticated than the Apple. Why why is it that IBM succeeded? in this design. These are important strategic decisions, uh, um, important strategic outcomes. So how, do, how did these come about? So I think that's an important question. And it's not just an important question for products. It's also an important question for services in the public sector, the private sector. What you see in, in delivery of services is that actually you also see an emergent design, if you like, of a particular way of selling cars, for example, or of selling books. I mean, it's quite interesting that you, if I asked you a few years ago, 10 years ago, where would you get a book from? Most of you would have gone to a bookshop. Of course, now we've got a new model, which is Amazon, um, and many sh bookshops are closing. Um, but we've, got, we've had innovation in the way in which um, services are delivered. But for many years, the dominant design was actually selling it through a shop which had lots of books in it. And it sounds very archaic now, but you can basically get it, order it for the internet, and many people do. So you can think about dominant designs